I'm Sam Roberts of the New York Times, and welcome to the New York Times Close Up. Crime, incarceration, punishment, how do we address the inequities of our penal system, specifically on Rikers Island? First on today's docket, Joanne Page, the president and chief executive of the Fortune Society, the organization that provides futures beyond prison walls for ex-offenders. Then The Times' co-chief film critic A.O. Scott brings us his take on the latest movies and what's happening in Hollywood. We'll address some of the major issues of the week on The Backstory, and I'll offer some additional thoughts on CODA. But first, Joanne Page, the president and chief executive of the Fortune Society. We're hearing more and more about Rikers Island, the plan to close it. There's been a lot of talk about that ever since the Koch administration. Now it seems like it's moving more toward reality in an announcement by Mayor de Blasio this week. It sounds like a good idea, but we're going to have the same inmates, the same guards, Aren't we creating five little Rikers Islands or four? You know, in the role that I'm in, I have to recognize progress. So the fact that we're locking up many fewer people is huge progress because Rikers does massive human damage. And if fewer people get damaged that way, that's better. So in 1991, there were over 21,000 people there. Uh, we've seen the numbers go down. Under this mayor, they've gone down 27 percent. We're just under 9,000. That's a major, major achievement. But at the Fortune Society, we see the human damage that Rikers does, person by person. And 8,800 some people right there now is too many people. We lock up too many people too long and too brutally. And if you think about it, we spend $475 a day per person to do human damage that often lasts for a person's lifetime. But how do you persuade people in this society, which may not be as compassionate as it should and may not take uh, to heart Jacob Reese's uh, philosophy that uh, conscience and public interest have to come together, self-interest rather, have to come together, uh, to persuade people that making these people better when they come out is going to be better for everyone. Marty Horn, the former correction mm -hmm. commissioner, had a uh, essay the other day in the Daily News pointing out that you can't treat mental illness in jail. Uh, so where do you treat it? And what about education and occupational training? And if they don't get that kind of uh, aid, uh, not as a matter of altruism on the part of society, but on the part of uh, making them better and more employable when they come out, how are they going to get it? Well, I think you start with the Hippocratic Oath first, right? Which is first, do no damage. Mm -hmm. If we lock up fewer people, we damage fewer people. And what we know about locking people up, the nickname for Rikers is Gladiator School. And again, we see the damage it does. If we lock up fewer people, we do less damage. If you lock somebody up at Rikers, the chance they're going to plead guilty and end up with a criminal record just to get out if they have a minor charge is enormous. They're two times or more likely to plead guilty than if they're out. And what we know is that will handicap people for the rest of their lives. So how do you speak to people about this, right? I think you start with enlightened self-interest, and that is, if 44% of the people are mentally ill at Rikers, putting them into gladiator school does not help community safety. It's an enormously expensive way of doing damage to vulnerable people in a way that makes communities less safe. There isn't a family in this country that doesn't have a family member with mental illness or substance abuse. I think you start by talking about common humanity and about enlightened self-interest. What we're doing, 50,000 admissions a year, and 75% of the people who get released get released into the community. And if we make them worse and spend a lot of money to do it and spend money that could have gone to healing communities, that's in nobody's interest. So, so some who, of it is how you say it. Who diverts them? The prosecutors, the judges, social workers? Where does that diversion take place? Who makes that decision and has it on his responsibility, his accountability, if it's the wrong decision? 
So I think you want multiple points of intervention. And we've been doing a lot of work with the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, Stanley Richards from our office as part of the Lippman Commission. So the first thing is we've seen length of case processing go up and up and up. If cases are handled sooner, you have fewer people in. Uh, with bail... Now, where's the, uh, the holdup there? Where's the roadblock? Sometimes it's about scheduling. Sometimes it's about allowing motions to last forever. Sometimes it's multi-defendant cases where the case just goes on and on. And actually having the jails in each borough should speed that up. It should speed it up because lawyers can get to people mm -hmm. faster. But also you can work the system in ways that mean cases get handled faster. Second is a third of the people at Rikers are out in four days or less. Why on earth do we do that? That's enough time to lose a job, to lose your housing, and to have your life fall You mean, apart. why do we bother putting them in? Why do we do that to a third of the people at Rikers? Mm -hmm. Why do that kind of damage at $475 a day? There's no safety reason, and there's no case processing reason that justifies it. So is that a bail issue? It is a bail issue for minor cases, because why are we setting bail in the first place? Mm -hmm. So there is a real conversation about eliminating bail for most misdemeanors. That would make a huge difference. It's interesting because the Brooklyn Bail Fund is now bailing people um, for fairly minor charges with fairly low bail, but they're people who would have stayed in for weeks. 95% show up rate. So why did we keep them in? So I think the first thing you do is say, why are these people here in the first place? If you can't justify it by likelihood they won't come to court otherwise, or that the crime they are convicted of, not detained for, but convicted of is so serious that it requires incarceration, why are we using jail? We use it as the first alternative. It should be the absolute last alternative. Why do we call it the correction system? Does it really correct anything? And why do we call, you know, prisons penitentiaries or people really penitent? You know, the Quakers came up with the idea of penitentiary, with the idea that people would do penance. And to give them credit, they were among the first to realize that if you lock people alone in a cell, um, you feed mental illness. Mm -hmm. So we are not in a system of rehabilitation. We're in a system of punishment. But we're seeing some changes. Like two things happened in 2018. One is that the Department of Corrections made a commitment to five hours of activity for people who are locked up. They're not quite there. What was there. it before? Huh? Uh, often nothing. Mm -hmm. Uh, they're not quite there. It's still being worked out. But, you know, I met with the deputy commissioner in charge of it yesterday. I think there's a real effort to provide services that matter. And then the mayor said that anybody sentenced and coming out of Rikers is eligible for a paid work period. Uh, these things can make a difference. But you know what? Par part of what makes this so hard is that the criminal justice system is nested in the issues of homelessness, of poverty, of joblessness, of the kind of desperation that people face. And most people in the jails come from the same handful of poor communities. Um, one of the things we're fighting about is that the public assistance rental allotment is $215 mm -hmm. a month. Uh, if you want to feed homelessness and feed people either being in the shelters or jails, have them have nowhere to live mm -hmm. except large violence-filled shelters yep. or jails. So we know how to do it better. We know how to do it cheaper. We just have to pay for it. You know something? We're paying for it. Yeah, we are at the we other are. end. We are paying $475 a day to lock somebody up. Mm -hmm. That's nuts. We could do so much better. Joanne Page, the chief executive and president of the Fortune Society, thank you for joining us. Its website is fortunesociety.org for more information on how to get involved in its programs. Thank you for joining us and coming up next, co-chief film critic A.O. Scott of The New York Times. Welcome back. Joining me now is my Times colleague, co-chief film critic A.O. Scott. He's been keeping cool most of the summer, maybe not today, in air-conditioned theaters, uh, watching movies, of course. 
Tony, uh, why do we have a new Oscars category for outstanding achievement in popular <laughs> film? I mean, is that demeaning? Is that appealing to the lowest common denominator? Well, it's, I mean, I, I'm, of course, in favor of outstanding achievements in unpopular film. That's kind of what well, I- Well, we seem to have I'm that a lot. Huh? Yeah, but I, I think what it is really is that it's, it's driven by, um, the desire for ratings. I don't think it's actually the ratings on the, uh, on the Tony of, Award show. Yeah, on the show from mm -hmm. from from ABC. It's this global broadcast. It's been losing ratings pretty steadily. Um, and one of the things that's happened coincidentally with this, and that gets blamed for it, is that the the movie industry is kind of split. Um, the the big studios put their their big money into big blockbuster franchise superhero action movies for a global marketplace. Um, but they also keep a, a hand in of making more, you know, prestige, um, kind of serious, ambitious, interesting movies. And smaller companies are, are in that too. And those have become kind of Oscar movies. So Oscar movies have become, um, in a way that they weren't, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, smaller movies. Um, and that's that's just a fact of the industry. So I think they're kind of desperately trying to correct for this, like, at the level of the broadcast. Um, and I think it's driven by uh, the desire for ratings in a sense that if you don't have huge global ratings, um, you're, you're, you're somehow not um, relevant. And, and, and that somehow the, the same people, this is what I think is the most dubious calculation, is that the same people who go and see all of the Marvel movies and all of the Star Wars movies will tune in to this four hour long, interminably boring broadcast on a Sunday night um, in February if their movies might get a prize. Does this affect the quality of motion pictures that are put out? Other than perhaps boost the ratings for the Oscar show? Well, it, it remains to be seen whether it will do that, and I kind of doubt that it will. I, I don't think, I think there, there's, um, there are plenty of other threats to the quality of, of, of movies, and those threats have always been there. Somehow, for most of the history of movies, they've been on the brink of collapse and, and have been, you know, just heading into a terrible, disastrous state. And yet somehow, interesting movies keep getting made, People keep going to see them. Um, the thing kind of limps along from crisis to crisis. Speaking of which, we seem to find so many interesting movies now on uh, video channels, streaming channels. Why do people go to the movies anymore? Well, people like to leave the house. Um, as you were saying before, people like uh, air conditioning. I mean, it, it's a very interesting thing that's happened. It's a, it reminds me a little bit of how you know, 15 or so years ago in the publishing industry, everyone was talking about ebooks, and no one was gonna buy books anymore. Everyone was just gonna read books on their Kindles. And what happened was a certain, that, that ate into the, 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 the sales of books to a certain degree, but it didn't kill it. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, books have come back a little bit. And I think that you have something similar where people like to watch movies at home. They like to watch all different things at home. They like the variety. Um, they like the sort of the sense of the tailored algorithm that tells, that sort of suggests things that they might want to watch based on what they've already watched. But they also like to go out with their friends um, or their families or just by themselves in, in, in the middle of the day, the way I do, and, and go watch movies. So Not all of us can go out in the middle right. Right. Day like you do, <laughs> or on a Sunday, or a Saturday, or or, or at night. So I, I think it, um, and and you found an interesting phenomenon here in New York in the last couple of years, especially in the summer, where the revival business um, has done really well. Mm -hmm. So people are, and young people, are paying money and buying tickets to go see things that they could watch on DVD mm -hmm. or on a streaming platform, just. For the for the sense of occasion um, and and to sit in a big dark room with a bunch of, of people um, watching a movie, so I think that is still appealing as a as a as a cultural activity. But we are now in this landscape where you can watch some kind of motion picture, whether it's a, a television series you're binge watching or a feature film or a documentary or whatever, on your laptop, your TV, your phone at the movie theaters. And I, I think that this is. Um, causing something of an upheaval in, in, in the business. And I think that the, the, what's happening with the Academy and the, and the popular motion picture category is, is a sign of sort of panic. Well, what's special about movies? What's, what, how are movies 
you know, going to stay relevant um, to, to, to people's lives. You and Manola Dargis have written a lot about the fact that uh, there's been a backlash to the sexual abuse scandal in Hollywood. Uh, one of the things that, that is so fascinating is how do you separate art and artist when you have an artist who has made great films and now is caught up in that scandal? Do we shun them? Do we say we're not going to see them? We're not going to give them awards? How do we deal with that? Well, I mean, I don't think that there's a single response, and I don't think that there's a, 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 a sort of a, a, a programmatic position that, that you can take. Um, I think it depends on, uh, on individual viewers um, and people's tastes. It also depends on the, the business judgment of the, of the companies who, who back um, these, these And artists. the level of abuse. And, and, and the level of abuse. But, uh, but I, I think, you, you know, you, you, you had a lot of, of television um, broadcast companies and, and also uh, movie studios, you know, backing away from um, people that they work with, like, for example, Woody Allen. Um, I, I, what I think is, is, is that um, it's, it's a kind of a, we're, we're in the middle of and maybe at the early stages of a kind of a more widespread conversation about how this um, plays out. And I think it plays out in very different cases um, in, in, you know, depending, right, on, on, on what's been alleged, on what's been done. But I think also that, that, that there's a tendency to focus on the abusers and what happens to them, um, and not enough attention being paid, not only to the, 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 the victims um, of, of abuse and the people who, whose, whose careers were, were um, thwarted and, and, and stymied in all kinds of ways, um, but also just the, the, the conditions and the systems that allowed these things to, to happen. Every, every single account that you read, um, whether it's about you know, Les Moonves or Harvey Weinstein, um, or, or, or Woody Allen um, or anyone else, there, there, is, there is a system in place that enables these things to happen, that protects um, the people who do it. It's, it's, it's not, I mean, it's not as extreme as what's happening in the Catholic Church, but it's not dissimilar um, that you have unaccountable men in power and other men who will protect them and who will keep the secret. Um, and you have the sense that everybody knew Right, that, that, that everybody knew and nothing was done. And, and I, I think until that's sort of thoroughly aired out, um, that, that, that uh, we're not going to move behind this, beyond this. And I, and I think there was, there was an initial impulse partly on the part of movie studios and television networks and other institutions that were involved just to sort of to cut the guys off, cast them out, and say, okay, there's no, there's no problem here. We kicked no, Harvey Weinstein out of the it. academy. Nothing to see here. We're all, we're all good. But yeah. of course that's not the case. Thanks to A.O. Scott for joining us, and of course, look for his reviews in the New York Times and nytimes.com. The backstory is next. Welcome back. What kind of week has it been? And a word wacky, especially in Washington, closer to home. We do have a primary coming up with some contests that might be closer than you think. Joining me, Metro Politics reporter Jeffrey Mays. Jeffrey, uh, we do have the primary coming up, and that is sooner than most people think. Is there any sense out there that people are aware there's a primary in that Queens race, the congressional race with Joe Crowley? Uh, he obviously uh, didn't think there was going to be much of a turnout and lost. Uh, what about the incumbents? Are they trying to get out the vote? Uh, or not. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, if you look at the gubernatorial primary, for example, uh, Governor Cuomo is out pushing his agenda every day, announcements every day, reminding people of what he's done. Uh, he believes he's the most progressive politician in the state, and he's not letting voters forget that. Um, but I think he's gotten a, a good challenge from Cynthia Nixon, who's really hit him on a lot of issues. Um, I think initially in the campaign, she made him look a little reactionary. Um, he seems to have calmed down a bit now. Um, so it's going to be interesting interesting uh, with that race that comes out. Also, you have the attorney general's race, uh, Democratic primary for that race, which is, uh, which is starting to heat up a bit. And that is a real multi-person race. Absolutely. I mean, you have uh, Letitia James, who's the public advocate, uh, Alicia Eve, who's a Verizon executive, Sean Patrick Maloney, uh, first gay congressman um, in the state, and Zephyr Ticha, who gave uh, Governor Cuomo a good run for his money uh, a few years ago. Um, I was at a forum, a technology forum with them 
earlier this week. Um, and you could see the little feistiness going on. You know, I saw Tish going after Zephyr and I saw Sean Patrick Maloney kind of going after Zephyr and, and Tish a little bit. So um, I think those issues are starting to bubble up. I uh, wrote a story earlier this week about how the candidates are uh, trying to measure themselves about who is most independent from Governor Cuomo. Um, and Tish James has taken a lot of criticism for being a little too close to the governor um, and her candidates have jumped on that. Well, why did she do that? Uh, obviously, she'd like the governor to be close to her. But what does she get out of praising the governor when the attorney general theoretically ought to be more independent? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, she got the Democratic Party nod, you know, and this is a state where uh, Democrats outnumber Republicans two to one. So that's a huge advantage for her. Um, she's, uh, it's been a little risky as well. well it's a big advantage in November, but it's a big advantage in the primary. Well, money. She's, mm -hmm. she is, uh, she's traditionally, if you talk to Tish, she'll tell you that she's traditionally had an issue fundraising. Uh, she's raised uh, $1.2 million in, in over just a couple of months right now. And some of those donors almost 30 percent of those donors also gave money to Governor Cuomo. So those are two big ways that she's been helped. Uh, now, it has also hurt her because the candidates are saying, as you said, well, you need to be the check on the governor. You know, you're going to be the check in Albany. We have had a couple of high level uh, convictions uh, recently. So uh, the attorney general cannot be connected to the governor. Also, uh, that's probably the most competitive statewide race. How do the candidates distinguish themselves in a race like that that is relatively down ballot uh, that people, you know, aren't paying all that much attention to? Yeah, it was interesting. At the candidates forum, I saw Alicia Eve, uh, who's a Verizon executive, uh, former advisor to Governor Cuomo, Hillary Clinton. She kept harping on her experience, how she was the most experienced person, uh, you know, in the race. Zephyr Teachout is uh, battling on her credentials of being a corruption fighter um, and having been a professor who's written books about corruption and prosecuted corruption. Um, those, you know, that's her stake. Tish is just saying she's the best candidate all around with the most experience, the most years of experience um, and the broadest reach. Uh, she talked about how she's going to tackle issues from gun violence to the environment as well. And Sean Patrick Maloney, too, is reaching out to that base, uh, relying on his experience as a lawyer, saying that he believes he's the most experienced candidate. So I think you're right. They, they agree on most of the issues. Um, that's why this issue of who's the closest to Cuomo has become a really uh, hot issue in the last uh, couple of weeks. Let me ask you about an issue closer to home, Uber. Why did they lose this time in the city council? They've been very powerful lobbying, very powerful with campaign contributions. Why did they lose? And, you know, why weren't they able to exercise their political clout? Yeah, I think if you remember in 2015, uh, when Mayor Bill de Blasio first proposed this cap, they unleashed this really brutal uh, campaign against him, uh, and it, it beat back the challenge very quickly. Um, I think what's changed this time around is that, you know, it's, uh, you know, now have 100,000 uh, for hire vehicles on the road. Mm -hmm. uh, there's congestion. Um, and I think that Uber uh, has had their own problems. They've had uh, some discrimination issues that have come forward. Uh, they have a new CEO who's trying to give them a little warmer image. So they laid off of the mayor this time. They did not go after him um, as uh, roughly as they did previously. And I think the politics have changed. You have a new speaker in there, Corey Johnson, uh, who really has the support of the city council. He was able to shepherd this legislation through very smoothly this time. And now they're trying to do an end run perhaps in Albany. Right, right. Um, and, you know, I think the, the issue, too, is Uber has a lot of options here. You know, you talk to Uber, they still plan to grow. They're going to they're gonna try to recruit other for hire vehicles on the road. Um, and they see an out in that, you know, if service is being hurt in some areas, they can petition to, for new licenses as well. Jeffrey C. Mays of The New York Times, thank you for joining us. And I'll have some additional thoughts next. It's less than two weeks until the one and only Cuomo-Nixon debate, which the governor petulantly agreed to only if he got to set the rules. That's another reason for public campaign financing, coupled with mandatory and regular freewheeling give-and-take debates among the candidates. Meanwhile, though, if you could ask the governor one question, what would you want to know? Mine would be a two-parter. What's your vision for a third term? And if your agenda for the next four years is so urgent, 
Why didn't you fulfill it before? When Andrew Cuomo ran for governor in 2010, he declared, together, we can make New York great again. This week, mocking President Trump, he said, America was never that great, that is, never great enough. He derided the president's slogan as retrospective and asked, what was the great time that he wants to take us back to? The question for Andrew Cuomo is, where does the governor want to deliver New Yorkers to over the next four years? Third terms have been notoriously unkind to New York elected officials. Governor Pataki entered office proposing that governors, starting with him, be limited to two terms. But after the 9-11 terrorist attack, he decided that he was so indispensable that he ran again. During his third term, the restoration of the death penalty, which he had championed, was voided by the Court of Appeals. His austerity agenda was thwarted by the legislature. Mario Cuomo's third term was mostly remembered for a multi-billion dollar budget gap, which he said held him hostage to negotiations with Albany Republicans and resulted in an embarrassing and prolonged Hamlet on the Hudson flirtation with the presidential campaign. Still, he guided the state through another recession without either raising broad-based taxes or letting the social safety net fray. I remember Mario Cuomo telling me, by the time you get to the third term, people are tired of you. The constant exposure tends to be too much. And after a while, people take for granted what did they like, and they want new things that you can't deliver. He said, I recall the good political advice my son Andrew Cuomo gave me. You'll want to do everything, but the people won't be able to remember everything. So pick one thing and say it over and over. I'm the education governor or the environment governor. Keep it simple and repetitive to help the people remember. Good advice. After eight years, I wonder, which category would Governor Andrew Cuomo claim to describe himself? We'll be back Labor Day weekend. And for The New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Sam Roberts.